Clap for Jesus. I love that. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Exodus chapter number 5. We're going to cover a lot of ground this morning. I hope to hear lots of flipping as you work through the pages. There's a pew Bible there for you if you need it. Uh, We also give you those note sheets coming in. It's one of the best ways to stay connected and engaged in the service. And if you're watching online, it's it's really, really difficult uh, to watch online and to stay connected. Uh, tied in. We've all done it, right? Your pastor included. I've sat at home and watched a service with you <laughs> online. Um, it's tough to stay dialed in because of the distractions at home. Uh, again, I remind you, my wife, home just a few weeks ago, she said she just took out a notepad and took her own notes. She said, I appreciate you doing the notes online, but I took my own and I paid more attention. Message received, right? I'm grateful. So uh, thank you for that. It's a great way to stay connected. Ashley and Chase were out shopping just the other day and came across a shirt. It's been an image you've seen on social media before, I'm sure, but it said 2020, and then it looked like one of those reviews where you could give a five-star review underneath. It had one star, and the quote underneath is, would not recommend it. Would not recommend it. It's been quite a year. Uh, I know we've had the pandemic. I know we've had... um, lockdowns, shutdowns, and phased reopenings, and uh, I believe uh, I'm not the only person that's tired of hearing about a dimmer switch, but anyway, um, we've had these phased reopenings, but I I just want to remind you, lest you've forgotten the tumultuous year for it's been for the world. Here's three other headlines, in case you've forgotten. Uh, Murder hornets. The bubonic plague resurfaces in inner Mongolia. Hey, how about this one? The National Weather Service issues its first, wait for it, not a Babylon Bee story, fire NATO warning. That's a thing, y'all. That's not a Netflix movie. That's a thing. Fire NATOs. It's been quite a year. And um, even before 2020, life Just what you would classify as normal life has enough ups and downs that we would aptly describe it as a roller coaster. Moses' life is no exception. In fact, he's had this incredible encounter with God at the burning bush. He goes and meets his uh, father-in-law Jethro, spends time with them, then launches out. He and Aaron come before the elders at the end of chapter 4, where we were last week, and they have this great revelation. They tell them the word of the Lord. They have a wonderful time of worship. And then we come to the passage that Pastor Norm read for us as we open our time together. Now, we're going to cover quite a bit of ground today. We'll start in chapter 5 and work through all the way to verse 5 of chapter 7. Don't worry, we won't touch every single verse. There's no way. But I'm going to give you some things. I need you to go back and reread this over the course of this week. Spend some time in the text with these notes to help guide you and make your own as well. Think about that, though. We've come off this really high moment of worship and now to this really depressing moment, if you will, of confrontation with Pharaoh. It reminds me of, well, it reminds me, if you have to think ahead chronologically in the Bible, to Elijah, the prophet getting discouraged to the point of giving up. After literally calling down fire from heaven and and kind of taking one for the team in a great way and seeing the drought end in the land, Jezebel pursues him and he says, I'm ready to die. You'll recall it was after Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, a great spiritual high, if you will, and he was met with an attempt by the enemy himself at devastating discouragement and compromise. Discouragement doesn't discriminate. It comes for the down and out and the up and in. There's plenty here that piles on for the people of Israel. There's plenty here that piles on for Moses and Aaron. And as we see the saga unfold in the weeks and months ahead, there's plenty that will pile on the people of Egypt too. I want to walk through chapter 5. We're just going to touch some things that have already been read. Let's set the stage, if you will. Then we're going to spend some time with some points. We'll take notes in chapter 6. And there's one point in chapter 7 we'll note for our time today. The sermon title, wow, just really encouraging this morning. When life gets harder, not better. Anybody relate? 
Let's walk through chapter 5 together. Look at verse 1. Moses and Aaron are standing before Pharaoh, and the Lord says. They say, thus says the Lord. They say that to Pharaoh right there. Now, they're operating on a position of presupposition instead of an evidence-based uh, evangelism here or apologetic. We talked about this last Sunday night in our group Bible study that we have on Sunday nights. Please join us at 6 p.m. on Sunday night. It's a Zoom link. You click it, you dial in, you've got the handout or you've got your book. It's a great way to stay connected in case you miss Sunday school on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. with us here. It's not just about content, it's about community. But last week it came up operating and starting from a position, this presupposition that God's word is authoritative. And what the Lord says matters, and it's true. I'm going to start from that position. It's a great place to start, probably in the southeast, with probably 80% of the evangelistic encounters that you'll have. But there will be some that have no regard, no knowledge, and no no basis to base anything on because they've not even been exposed to the Word of God. You may have to come at them with an evidence-based apologetic. Moses here comes with a presupposition and says, The Lord says, and Pharaoh recoils. Verse 2, Pharaoh says, Lord, who is the Lord? What Lord? I'm not obeying this Lord. I I, I don't recognize his authority. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to comply with you. Now, this word Lord, Yahweh or Jehovah, it's God's personal name, which he's revealed to Moses in chapter 3, but it's the first time it's been invoked in this way. Pharaoh is saying, who is this God? I've never heard of him. Why should I obey him? After all, I'm Pharaoh. I'm supreme ruler over a vast empire with unprecedented power and wealth. I am not in the habit of letting other people tell me what to do. Now, I'm going to get to application a little bit later. We're going to have to weave it in for time's sake. But listen, that's the position that every one of us take before God when we rebel against him in our sin. One of the commandments is, you shall have no other gods before me. You know how we distort that in our rebellion? We will have no God above me. Who is the Lord? By the way, it's our default position until we become confronted with the claims of Christ and under conviction of the Holy Spirit to repent of our sins and put our faith and trust in Christ alone. It would have been great if Pharaoh would have done that, but that's not what happens. They go back and forth in the next few verses. We wind up in verse 6. Pharaoh reasserts his authority over the people. He's commanding the taskmasters into the people and to their foremen saying, you go and lay it on. What he's doing, what Pharaoh's doing when he does this, is basically turning from Moses and turning to all of his people and saying, I'm the Lord here. I don't know what he's talking about or who he's talking about, But let me just show you how I am in charge. I'll tell everyone what to do. Don't give them what they need. Let's make it harder. In verses 7 through 19, things are already bad. Now they are much, much worse. Can I bring your attention? I don't think I gave it to you to highlight, Mark. Sorry, no worries. But take your Bible. Just look at verse 9 with me. There's a passage that occurred there. uh, Exodus 5, 9. It's, It's exactly where Pastor Norm ended his reading this morning. I love when he reads, um, just with great delivery there. He almost preaches when he reads. I love it. But look at what it says in verse 9. That phrase it ends with, let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor in it and pay no regard to lying words. Now, what lie has been told? In Pharaoh's mind, it's not that the people will be let go. Remember, there's no promise of Exodus. He's saying, let the people, let's just go worship three days journey. A little bit of a bait and switch, but we can address that some other time. The lie that Pharaoh's addressing is that there's any power above Pharaoh. Let me show the people how tough I can make it so they don't think there's any hope outside of me. That's the lie. It's a lie that every one of us believes. We think we're self-made men and women, and that's just not possible. Things were already bad. They're getting much worse. And then we come to verse 20 where the foremen have kind of had this thing laid on. You know how this goes. You, re- you remember this. You'll read it this week, please, in your reading time. They, they take the straw from them. They make them keep the 
workload up, the quota is the same, the work conditions are worse, the foremen come back and cry to Pharaoh. Pharaoh has the foreman beaten and then tells them, no, you get out of here. The foremen then leave and meet Moses and Aaron while they're depart- departing Pharaoh's presence. And they come out from Pharaoh. And here's what they say in verse uh, 21. Look at the next verse there. They're saying, what have you done to us? The Lord judge you. You've made us stink in the Egyptian sight. You, you've given them everything they need to hurt us. The, the verse there says, you've put a sword in their hand to kill us. This is bad, y'all. I, I know you may have had a tough week, but come on. This is, this is bad. And Moses then, completely discouraged, verse 22 and 23, has a crisis of faith. Now, it's one thing to be discouraged and lament to God. We covered some lament in the psalm this summer as we as a nation were going through turmoil and still are to a large degree. And we as the church needed to lament and learn how to do it biblically. Moses crosses a line here, though, in some of these things that he says. These are not modeled in any of the laments of the psalm. Look with me at verses 22 and 23. Let me just read it to you. I'll unpack what he's saying. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? Verse 23. For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Mercy. What a contrast to the end of the previous chapter. They were all worshiping together, excited about what was coming. And now Moses is crying out to God. The people are utterly crushed. They cried out to their foreman. The foreman cried out to Pharaoh. He was unsympathetic. The people have now cried out to Moses. There's no indication they cried out to God again. And why would they? Can I be honest for a moment with you, transparent? Why would the people cry out to God again? Think about that for just a moment. The last time they did... God said he heard and responded. He sent Moses away for 40 years to Midian. They didn't know who Moses was. Moses comes back, and now at his first point coming back, it's kind of blown up in their face. Have you ever done that? Well, I tried that. That didn't work. What's next? (laughs) Things got worse. Have you ever taken a step of faith? You ever committed to fast and pray about a matter? You ever obeyed a clear command in Scripture and everything piled up on you? It seemed like as a result, the enemy launched a massive offensive in direct response to your step of faith. You you may be in the throes of this right now. We have the benefit of the whole story, most of us in the room. Aren't you glad this isn't how the saga ends? Beloved, I want to tell you this morning, even if you're in the throes of it, that's not how the story ends. Hang on. Because the people rejected Moses, he cries out to God, wanting to know why this was happening. I want to show you three things, three red flags in his prayer. This is the point where he is. This is why I call it a crisis of faith. Number one, he's questioning God's goodness. Do you see it? You've done evil. Why is he questioning God's goodness? Because of what he sees in front of him. Number two, he's questioning God's plan. Why is he questioning that? Because of what he can't see. Why did you call me? I can't do this. You picked the wrong guy. You picked the wrong guy. And thirdly, in this crisis of faith, he is questioning God's actions. You could also say activity. Remember, he says, you've not delivered them at all. At all. You've done nothing. Moses reminds me of me. Moses was an imperfect sinner like you. This deliverer that God had called, this Charlton Heston with the staff and the flowing robe, right? The chiseled jawline, imperfect sinner. He was a man in desperate need of God's mercy and grace like us. And here he is in a crisis of faith. Do you remember just a few verses ago where God told him that Pharaoh was going to reject it? That he said, the people are not going to be delivered except I do mighty acts and exploits and you're going to do miracles and signs and that's going to have to happen before Moses and then I'm going to require... Like, God kind of went through this in chapter 3, verse 19 and 421. 
I get that Moses was disappointed, but he shouldn't have been shocked, should he? I mean, this just happened. But how quickly, when you're in the throes of it, does a circumstance cloud your memory of the Word of God? You get in the storm, and all you see is the storm. You don't see Jesus walking on the water in the midst of the storm. You get in the storm, and you forget that you are standing on the rock that won't sink. When things go from bad to worse, what do you do? What do you do when you feel like you're in a crisis of faith because of what you can't see in front of you, because of what you can see in front of you, because nothing seems to be going the way it should go? Our discouragement in the face of difficulty and affliction often clouds our thinking. We've got to remember that God is at work. I'd point you to the underlying theme of our whole series in Exodus, which says, stand firm, fear not, and see the salvation of the Lord. I'm going to move quickly through these headers now as we work through chapter 6 to show you how God responds to address Moses' discouragement. For Moses, the Lord needs to speak. Brothers and sisters, for you and I, God has already spoken. Let me just say that. Make a distinction here between what's descriptive of Moses and what's prescriptive for us. In chapter 6, verse 1, the Lord says to Moses, God responds, now you're going to see something. <laughs> you're going to see what I will do. I'm going to, with a strong hand, send them out. With a strong hand, I'm going to drive them out of his Land. Let me address a big picture issue that we need to see here. Remember Pharaoh, over the next several chapters, from chapters 5 through 14, Pharaoh has said, who is the Lord? I'm in charge. From chapters 5 through 14, God is going to show Pharaoh who is in charge. Who is Yahweh, asks Pharaoh. God sends ten plagues. He takes the life of every firstborn Egyptian. And they parts the Red Sea in order to declare, I am alone am the Lord. This is what I can do. I'm the Lord over Egypt. I'm the Lord over Israel. And I'm the Lord over you, Pharaoh. By the way, the phrase, I am the Lord, appears for the first time in this way as a declarative thing in Exodus. But then it's repeated a dozen or so times in the Exodus narrative. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? God answers time and time again. Side note here, real quick. Uh, make a jot in your notes. Ready? When he says, I am the Lord, he declares it, I am the Lord to Israel. So I am the Lord to Israel. That's in Exodus 3.15. He says, I am the Lord to Egypt. That's in Exodus 7.5. We'll, we'll land on that in a few minutes. And he's the Lord of all nations. I love this. It's a few chapters down the road. But in chapter 9, verse 16, he says, But for this purpose, I've raised you up to show my power. Watch this. Old Testament. That my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. He is Lord of all. Church, the God that we serve, there is no God above him. There's nobody seated on his level. He's not at the table with other gods trying to prove a case. The heavens are his throne, the earth is his footstool, and he stands in the solitude of himself. He's God. He's Lord. And he can be trusted. God's about to encourage Moses with this promise. If you look at verse 1, what's the encouragement here? Here are your notes. Number 1, there are three, and the third one has a few subpoints. You know how I do. Here we go. Number 1, God is in control. If you feel tossed by the winds and waves of life, and life seems to be getting harder, not better, and you're about to say, I didn't sign up for this, let me encourage you to take your eyes off the things that are swirling around you and fix them on the Lord and be reminded that God is in control. God will do what He wills. He will do it when He wills on His timetable. And God's will is for His glory, which is for our good. Church, God is in control. God is shouting to you in the midst of the storm, I am the Lord. He is shouting to you in the midst of life caving in around you, I am in control. Let the church say amen. God is in control. A favorite verse that we have, Romans 8, 28. Most of us quote it. It's great to quote it in context. Let me just touch it quickly before we move on to the next point this morning. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, we'd like to read that like everything's going to work out 
good for those who are called according to his purpose. No, it's for good. It's for the good of us. And what's for the good of us? The glory of God. For God to shine through the cracks of your imperfection. When you are crushed on every side and perplexed, oh, for God to shine through that brokenness. When you're backed into a corner for the fruit of the Spirit to come out instead of the venom that the world would spew. We're marked. We're different. We operate from the presupposition because it's true. God is in control. Number two this morning. Verse two. God is faithful. God is faithful. Lord, I, I don't know if, if you're really, I question your goodness. I question your plan. I, I, I question if you're even at work. Oh, oh, I, I, I'm in control. You may not see it, but I'm in control. And, and let me remind you, I'm faithful. Would you look at these verses with me? Verses two through five. Verses two through five. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. There it is again. I love it. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant, watch this, with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I've heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slave, and I have remembered my covenant. We covered this a few weeks ago. If you're just joining us, God didn't forget his covenant. The word picture here is I've moved it to the front burner. To deal with what's going on. Church family, God keeps every single promise he has made in his word. God keeps his promises. He's faithful. Oh, it's 2020 and I've seen too much weirdness on social media. So I've got to address this. By the way, I don't have any of you in mind, but I need to go here. When I say that God keeps every promise, I'm quantifying it with that he's made in his word. I cannot vouch for some abstraction that men and women have claimed through the years. And they start it with a statement like this. God told me. Or the Lord promised me. Or I got a word from God. Or, you know, I've got a promise from God I'm clinging to. If it's not contained within the 66 books of this Bible, I'm going to tell you, you better dial it down. You better dial it down. I'm not saying the Lord doesn't speak, but I am convinced, standing on the authority of God's word, as your pastor and one of the elders, we would speak in one accord. God speaks through his word. When the Holy Spirit gives you a word, you can find it in scripture. That's how you know it's from God. And it'll be in context and not just something descriptive from some other time where God did something one time to prove a point. It'll be prescriptive and work for all time. I'm saying that God keeps his promises, but be careful to make sure you are finding them in the source text from God's word. Back it up by the book. I found that most people that claim I've got a promise from God, it's usually about their comfort, their ease of pain, avoiding hardship, or a miracle that prolongs the here and now. And not necessarily is for the good of those called to the Lord for the glory of God. But God is faithful. God keeps his covenant with his people. He's encouraging Moses here that he has brought that back to the front of his mind. He's the God that remembers he's faithful. He's the rock that you can run to in a weary land. Church, God is in control. God is faithful. Third promise this morning. Our God saves. Our God saves. Now, it's enough to just say that, right? Please don't freak out. Some of you are sweating bullets looking at the amount of text. It looks like I'm about to cover. Don't worry. I'm going to give you some headers. You're going to cover that this week in your reading. We don't have time. But I want to tell you this morning, our God saves. I want to give you a few guiding thoughts for your own study. When we say God saves, it's so much more than just a ticket out of hell and into heaven. When we say our God saved, it's so much more than just getting the children of Israel out of of Egypt, there are several aspects to what it means for God to save. And it is amazing at how in this Old Testament passage, it's highlighted a New Testament reality that we enjoy as children of God. Our God saves like a precious diamond. You and I are going to take this thing that you can turn in the light and appreciate different angles of that one work of art in that diamond. We're going to shift that thing around and look at a few different aspects we see in God's word. And they're all brilliant and they're all deep. And I'm going to try to make it through them without crying. I couldn't this morning when I was reading over it. Number one, notice the freedom. I want you to write that down. Our God saves. He gives freedom. Or you can write, he liberates. You wordsmiths want to use the liberation word. That's fine. It's all good. It works the same. 
Chapter 6, verse 6, first half of the verse. Do you see it? Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, I, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. God will bring his people out of slavery, he's saying. It's not because Israel earned this. God will do this as an act of grace and grace alone. They are going to be free. Why? Free to be me? No. Free to worship Him. Remember, all this is about getting the people so they can worship God. You have been set free this morning if you are in Christ. Not to exploit your freedoms for creature comforts and consumption. You have been set free to worship the Lord God Almighty. Oh, when our God saves, it's a salvation that brings freedom. Second thing I want you to notice here. Notice the redemption, second half of this verse. The redemption, he says, it's right there. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. I will redeem you. Notice the redemption. Tim Keller writes, there is no more basic word in the Bible than redemption. The word carries the idea of purchasing, but there's more to it than that. This word redeem here in Hebrew communicates that there's a privilege or duty of a close relative. You remember the story of Ruth. That's the picture here, this kinsman redeemer. The geal is the word there. The word for redeemer plays off of that. It's goel. It actually sounds like gospel. It's, that's just me saying that, though. Not many theologians I can find to agree with me on that, but hey, there you go. Because of God's mercy and grace and unfailing love, he is the ultimate kinsman redeemer. God is going to protect Israel. He's going to champion his family while they are in need. God is coming to the aid of his people, and he's going to redeem them with justice. If you're discouraged today, let it sink in to your skull and to your heart that our God is a redeeming God. He has chosen of his own will with no external pressure to provide, to protect, to champion your eternal salvation because it brings him pleasure. What a God. What a salvation. Our God saves. He liberates. He redeems. Notice the adoption in verse 7. The adoption. Now, if I ever get invited to preach a week-long revival at a church somewhere, if the churches still do that in the South, I'm probably going to camp out with these different aspects of salvation. Y'all, I could preach on these for a minute. I'm telling you. I'm trying to hustle through and give you a literal minute so we can get through this. You ready? The adoption in verse 7. I will take you to be my people and I'll be your God and you shall know that I'm the Lord your God that's brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptian. When God saves you, he doesn't save you to live a life alone. When God saved Israel, he didn't just save uh, millions of individuals so they could go and be themselves as lone rangers. No, he saved them as a family and he saved them into a family. God has already identified Israel as his firstborn son. He was using familial language in chapter 4. What love? I remind you, adopted children are chosen children. In recent Senate confirmation hearings for the Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett, one person posted on the social media pages an image that said, can we just stop calling the children that Amy Coney Barrett and her family adopted? Can we stop referring to them as adopted children? They are her children, period, signed an adoptee. What does it mean to be adopted? You have a seat at the table by invitation and are afforded all the privileges of the family, which leads us to the next point. Our God saves. I want you to notice the inheritance in verse 8. I'm going to bring you into the land that I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give to you as a possession, for I am the Lord. God is promising his people a country. He first promised it to Abraham in Genesis 12. Now he's saying, I'm going to bring my people, my free, my redeemed, my adopted people into the land of promise. Glorification is a part of inheritance. John Newton shared an illustration like this many, many years ago. Can you imagine with me for just a moment that you... Imagine a man that inherited a large estate worth millions. Now, this is a long time ago. I'm going to mention a carriage. I'm just setting you up for that. 
Children, you can ask your parents what a carriage is later. Imagine a man that uh, inherited a large estate worth millions, and he had to journey to New York City, a long distance to get it. As he journeyed there, his carriage broke down, leaving him to walk the last one mile. Can you imagine that man saying, my carriage is broken, my carriage is broken, kicking and complaining in disgust when he only has a mile left to go to receive the million that's promised him? Can I remind you this morning, we have an inheritance, and I'm not talking about the mansion or the streets of gold or the room, depending on the way you like to interpret that in the Father's mansion. I'm not talking about any of that. Our inheritance is Christ. And it fades not away. The thing we get to do by faith now one day will become sight. We get to be in the presence of God Almighty, worshiping serving, ruling, and reigning with Jesus for all eternity. We have an inheritance that moth and rust cannot corrupt. If we can move past the genealogies that show up there, uh, there's some preaching there, but not for me this morning, okay? There's some beautiful genealogies for God to make the case and the point. Uh, He's fleshing out that inheritance. It's a beautiful passage. You'll read that this week. Don't blow through it, but actually take time to read through that. You're going to find yourself winding up in chapter 7. Turn to verses 3 and 4 while I set the stage for this final point. Our God saves. He liberates. He redeems. He adopts. He gives an inheritance. And he's the God that saves. Watch this. Unpopular in 2020. But look, he saves with judgment and mercy. Our God saves. He says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. Before you get too hung up on the fact that it said in God saying, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, let's go back to Pharaoh's first encounter with the word of the Lord. Moses said, the Lord says, and Pharaoh of his own will and own decision says, no, no, there's no Lord. I'm not even open to that. There's no Lord. He was already a hard man. You saw the way he dealt with that. If you follow the way it happens, and we will, you'll see there's sometimes that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Sometimes God hardened Pharaoh's heart. There's a sequence there. Make no mistake. Don't get hung up on that. In fact, in the Bible, we're committed not to harden our own hearts. In Psalm 95, as it relates to worship, Hebrews tells us not to harden our hearts, but continue in the faith. Don't harden your heart this morning. Pharaoh hardens his heart, and God rains down judgment and mercy as salvation. What's God's answer for Moses' discouragement when life got harder, not better? I'm in control. I'm faithful. I will save. If you'll read those next two verses later when you have time, you'll see that was enough to motivate Moses and Aaron to move forward. Church family, let me close. Obeying God is not a pain-free life. In fact, these chapters are an open rebuke to the empty promises of the modern-day prosperity heresy that presents itself and ports itself as a prosperity gospel. Anytime you have to put another word in front of gospel, Paul called that another gospel. Following Jesus does not mean you'll be popular, young people. Obeying God's word does not mean that you will be immune from awful problems, brother or sister, like cancer, like COVID. It doesn't mean that you'll not encounter spiritual warfare and times of despair. In fact, Jesus promised tribulation. You've heard me tell you that. In this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. You're an overcome. No, that's not what he said. He said, I've overcome. Look at me. Fix your eyes on Jesus. The question is not, will we ever have moments of discouragement? The question is, what happens when we have a crisis of faith? When we're discouraged? Well, I'm going to tell you something you've heard a little preacher from the heart of South End in Charlotte say a couple of times. Get in the word so the word can get in you because discouragement will cloud your thinking. And it will be hard for you, but I've come to remind you this morning, if your thinking is clouded, hear this word. God is in control. God is faithful to his word. And our God saves. If you're in Christ this morning, you're free. 
If you're in Christ, you're redeemed. If you're in Christ, you're adopted. If you're in Christ, you have an inheritance that will never fade. And if you are in Christ, you are on the right side of judgment and mercy. Let's stand together and pray. In Dietrich Bonhoeffer's last 24 hours before he was executed, he got men together there in the prison and held a Bible study and a worship time. He taught from 1 Peter 1, 3 through 12, knowing his end was just in sight. And he spoke on the living hope. When life is crumbling around you, getting harder when you thought it would get better, let me encourage you. Anchor into who God is. Let's pray. Father, what a picture for us. I pray that we would preach this gospel to ourselves this week and we would go and act in faith in you, our great God, remembering that you are in control. Lord, fill our minds with this. Help us to sing the gospel and to pray the gospel and to meditate on the gospel and to hear the gospel as our only hope in these troubled times. We love you. We bless you. We worship you now in Jesus' name. And the church said,